No, I think we're at the top of the hour. I think we can get started this evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Native Plant Society of New Jersey's uh, wonderful Wednesday webinars. Um, tonight, we're on the eve of Earth Day. It's a great time to have a webinar. We're going to be speaking about uh, spring beauties for biodiversity. My name is Randy Eckel. I'll be moderating the session. I'm one of the vice presidents of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. Uh, other panelists include Mike Jacob, who will be handling some of the technical details of the evening. Uh, Mike is also a vice president of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. And of course, our speaker, Deb Ellis, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Um, we encourage you all to visit npsnj.org and look at other webinars that are coming up. We'll be speaking about one uh, just at the end to, to let you know of our upcoming events. And please join us. Um, follow us on Facebook. Our goal is to promote the appreciation, protection, and study of New Jersey's native flora. So thank you for joining us this evening. Could I have the next slide, please? As we go over a few details on how uh, this evening's webinar is going to proceed. Let's see if we can get that. There we go. Um, so this is a Zoom webinar. It is not a meeting. Uh, that's why you can only see the few of us that are panelists instead of the hundreds of people that have signed on to listen to this evening's webinar. Um, we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation this evening. You can type your questions into the Q&A uh, portion of your screen, and then we'll be uh, parsing out those questions at the end and trying to combine similar questions so that Deb will have a chance to answer as many of your questions as she can. The webinar is going to be recorded and going to be available on www.npsnj.org in a few days. Uh, feel free to take photos of any of the slides if anything particularly intrigues you, uh, but you can always go to the recorded webinar on npsnj.org and revisit any of them. So I think without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, Deb Ellis, I've known Deb for many, many years. Uh, she is an environmental activist and advocate for the use of native plants in our gardens and landscapes for all the wonderful things that they can do for our gardens. Um, I've enjoyed many, many conversations discussing native plants with Deb, and I'm really excited to see what she has to tell us this evening about spring beauties. So without further ado, Deb, please take it away. Thank you so much, Randy. And thanks to each of you for being here. Randy, I've learned so much from you over the years, and I hope that you can learn a tidbit from me tonight. I want to thank each of you for taking the time to be here together on this eve of Earth Day. Um, and I want to begin by making sure my slides advance here. OK, oops. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my slides. OK. So I want to begin by just saying how much I love spring plants. I call them spring beauties, and that is one of the plants we're going to be talking about tonight. But sometimes native plants get kind of a bad rap. And so that's why I made that vase of beautiful spring flowers a few years ago. That was done about May 8th. And I want to also begin by thanking my parents, um, who are on the right with a much younger version of me, and who are long gone from this earth, but who gave me the love of native spring flowers. My dad, um, we were lucky when I was a young child to live near an apple orchard. And the, during my childhood, unfortunately, the apple orchard was destroyed for development. And when they were selling the apple orchard, the owners, Mr. and Mrs. Briggs, were very strategic and kind and called all the neighbors and said, come dig up our garden. So I have fond memories of digging up the Briggs's garden with my dad late at night, sometimes um, in the dark because it was after a long day of work for him and transplanting the plants by flashlight. Those plants from the Briggs's garden now live in my garden here in, that was in Wisconsin and they live in my garden in New Jersey and in many other people's gardens that I've been able to share them with. So, I am not a scientist, but I hope that I will give you tonight, share my love of plants and also the benefit of my experience. 
I have been gardening for 20 years and they say you never know a plant until you've killed it at least twice. I haven't killed all the plants twice, but I have some of them. And I hope that my experience will serve you well. So here's a view of a little corner of my garden in the spring. And by the end of tonight, you're going to know what all these plants are. We're gonna be talking about them. And I think what the pandemic has taught us all is to slow down and notice. So whether or not you have a garden, many of us have been outside looking around at nature more closely. To me, plants hold memories, they create meaning, and they teach us to observe and then care for the earth. Sometimes when we know the name of something, when we know about it, we're gonna care about it more. One of the things I love about being a gardener and being a native plant lover is that I'm always learning. And I'm excited tonight to do a deep dive on spring native plants with you. I, I do, I have given a lot of other webinars in my life, but usually they're about a whole series of plants in the, um, in different seasons. And so it's really a special opportunity, I feel, to really do a deep dive on just the spring plants. To me, every spring is magic because all my old friends appear again. Because native plants are almost all of them, not quite all, but almost all are perennials, they come up every year without us doing anything. And so it's just wonderful to look out my window or wander out to my backyard and see these gorgeous plants um, coming up. I'm gonna go back one. Ecologically, I wanted to also mention that these slides, that sorry, that these plants are important sources of food for our insects and our birds. Have you ever thought about what happens to insects in the winter? We all know the story of the, the magnificent monarch migration to Mexico, but most insects overwinter in our properties under our leaf litter. And we need then to provide food for them when they emerge early in the spring. So ecologically, the spring plants that are native are extremely important. So many, many years ago, Henry David Thoreau wrote about this plant called skunk cabbage. If you are afflicted with melancholy at this season, go to the swamp and see the brave spears of skunk cabbage buds already advanced toward a new year. They see over the brow of winter's hill, they see another summer ahead. Sometimes I'm afflicted with melancholy in March. I don't love the winter. And I love seeing skunk cabbage. My supportive husband went tramping around with me in a watery swamp on March 14th of this year. And that's where we saw this magnificent, magnificent skunk cabbage flower. It's really an unusual plant. It's thermogenic. That means it's able to heat the surrounding air and even melt snow. And it lures flies to pollinate it by its stinky smell and by imitating rotten meat. Now, if that doesn't make you love spring natives, okay, don't leave the webinar. I promise that's the only rotten example I'm gonna give you. Seriously, now the skunk cabbage is beautiful. Look at it, this is how it looks now. It's like a lava flow of leaves near the stream beds. They're big, big leaves, just like cabbage but they're poisonous, so don't eat them, please. I wanna go over with you before we go further what my goals are for tonight. I know I have a really diverse audience that some of you probably know more than I do, and that some of you are newbies to gardening or to native gardening, especially because it's wonderful that the pandemic got so many new people interested in gardening. So I'm gonna begin by talking a little bit about the importance of native plants and specifically spring native plants and talk about the key concepts of host plant and caterpillars as bird food. Then I'm gonna spend most of the time talking in detail about five categories, sorry, four categories of native plants. I spent a lot of time putting these in categories because I think sometimes it's helpful that 
to have things that's targeted to something you're looking for as a gardener. Many of them can be in more than one category, um, but I still think it's a helpful way to, to approach the subject. So we're gonna begin with some definitions to make sure that we're all on the same page and everyone knows these. The first definition is what's a native plant? Well, a native plant was here before the colonists arrived. So they're indigenous to our area. A good example is our state flower, the violet. Another term is an introduced plant. And an introduced plant, when I use that term, means it's introduced but not invasive. A good example of that is a daffodil because daffodils are from Europe and Eurasia, ultimately, but they are not invading our natural areas and not causing harm. Then the third category is invasive plants. And invasive plants are introduced species from other countries that have invaded our natural areas and are crowding out our native plants. Some examples of that are English ivy, barberry bush, and lesser celandine, which is particularly relevant um, in the spring. So why should we care about doing native plants? Why should we care about these as opposed to the introduced ones that many of us are very familiar with? Well, biodiversity is declining faster now than at any time in human history. Think about that for a minute. I think sometimes we are all very aware of it, or very unaware of it, sorry. It's very silent extinction going on. And, it's, and sometimes when things are slow, you don't notice them as much. Here's a few little facts to make us be worried. There's be, been a 3 billion decline of birds in North America in the last 50 years. There's been a 75% decline of Eastern monarchs in the last 20 years and an even worse decline of the Western monarch. And there's been a huge bee decline. 25% of North American bees are at risk of extinction. So that's really depressing news, but I'm a real optimist and I'd like to be able to do something. So the good news for tonight, especially on the eve of Earth Day, is that we can help by planting native plants. And why? Because native plants nurture the web of life. They co-evolved with our insects, our animals, our fungi, and our microbes, and they form a complex network of relationships. So if we plant the plants that feed the insects, that feed the birds, that feed the animals, we can help restore biodiversity. One of the leading thinkers in this area is Professor Doug Tallamy. He's at the University of Delaware, and he's written several books. The first is Bringing Nature Home, and another one is Nature's Best Hope. And he's coming out in, right now with a new book called The Nature of Oaks, The Rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Native Trees. So I urge you to look for one of his talks. He has a lot of talks that are on the web or look at his books if you'd like to know more. But I wanna say one thing about oaks. So native plants, as I mentioned, co-evolved with, with our insects, our plants, our, our animals. And because they co-evolved, they sometimes will only eat the native plants. They will not eat the invasives. The big example of that that many people know about is that without milkweed, we will have no monarchs. Monarchs will only lay their eggs on milkweed. And Doug Tallamy has researched that the very best thing we can do is to plant oak trees because oak trees support more than 500 different kinds of butterflies and moth. That means more than 500 different kinds of butterflies and moth will lay their eggs on oak trees and then eat those leaves and support the caterpillars. So what does that mean for our spring native plants? Well, many of our spring native plants are also specialized host plants for specific kinds of butterflies. So if we choose to plant specific native plants, we are helping a lot of butterflies. So a host plant is a plant where the butterfly or moth deposit the eggs, usually under the leaves, and then the caterpillar eats the leaves once it emerges. An example, again, is the violet. The violet is the state flower of both my home state, Wisconsin, and New Jersey, as well as Illinois and Rhode Island. It's a popular state flower for good reason. 
and it is a host plant for the fritillary butterfly. So why are, do I care so much about caterpillars? Because caterpillars fuel the food web. Caterpillars, we all know, become butterflies, but I'm gonna say something that you may not know, that caterpillars also become songbirds. That's because 96% of our land songbirds feed caterpillars to their young, even if they are birds that normally would eat fruit or seeds, they will feed caterpillars to their babies because caterpillars are perfect baby bird food. You can see a bird there with a nice big caterpillar. The caterpillars are perfect baby bird food because they're large. If you were a bird parent, would you rather look for hundreds of aphids or one caterpillar? They're large, they're full of protein, and they're squishy. So the baby, um, so the bird parents can stuff the caterpillar down the baby's uh, mouth. So we really need caterpillars to support the birds because look at that number. A songbird parent couple needs 6,000 plus caterpillars for one nest of babies. That is shocking. And so it's important to plant host plants so that we can support not only butterflies, but also birds. So I want to begin by a flower that defies all my categories, or actually probably fits into almost all of them, and that's our state flower, the violet. I want to begin with the violet because I think the violet needs some love. It's named because it's purple, violet, but it also it comes in white and yellow and very pretty ones that are white and violet. It has a fairly long bloom time. It's blooming right now in my backyard. And it's really very tolerant to different light conditions. It can grow in full sun or in shade. Some people call it pesky. That's why I want us to give it a little more love. It can be a ground cover because it covers the ground. And its wildlife value is very large because it's on Professor Doug Tallamy's top 10 list for supporting, um, for being a host plant and supporting butterflies and moths. As I mentioned, it's the primary host for the fritillary butterfly. And it's also edible. So I, a harbinger of spring for me is not skunk cabbage, but to go out and pick the leaves of the violets and put them in my salad. The young leaves are more tender, but I eat them all the way through the summer because the rabbits don't eat my violets and they do eat any lettuce I try to plant. And of course you can put the flowers in salads too and they're gorgeous. You can surprise your friends with that. A gardening tip for this is that the plants kind of leapfrog. So that's why some people call them pesky. They spread a lot. I deal with that by leaving them. It's better for the butterflies to have more host plants and by confining them, doing a little bit of both. I have a big patch of violets because I like them so much. And they're deer resistant. So I also wanna use this slide as an example of how I'm going to talk about the other flowers tonight. I'm not going to read every single line, but the slides are there with lots of information in case you wanna take a photo of them. I'm not going to always talk about the light because every single flower I'm talking about tonight does grow in shade. That's kind of unusual for a presentation on native plants, but it's true for tonight. They all grow in shade. So I'll point out more if they grow in sun. They, um, the size, I will sometimes talk about it will depend. And I will mention always the wildlife value. On the deer resistance, I want to just mention that there is really no deer proof plant. So deer resistance is not a yes or no question. It's really more a grade. But if I'm saying it's deer resistant, it means that it gets a grade of A. It doesn't mean that you should ever write to me if the deer eats it. Deer can eat anything if they're hungry enough and fawns especially might try to eat anything. But it means that the weight of evidence is that this plant is at least more deer resistant than others. How did I choose the plants that I decided to include? Well, I chose plants that are likely to be seen in natural areas in New Jersey, even if they're full of invasive plants and even if they're full of deer, or that are easy to buy and are garden worthy. 
or all of those things. I also tried to emphasize plants that were of highest ecological value in being host plants for butterflies. And also if they're specialist bees, I mentioned how important it is to have host plants for butterflies, but something I just learned today, unbelievably, this is the great thing we keep learning all the time, is that bees are also specialized to only go to some genuses of plants to get their pollen. And so that I have now indicated which of these spring flowers serve the specialist need of bees, and many of them do. I also wanna say something about the names. Every plant has a common name and a scientific name. And the scientific name has the genus and the species. I'm generally gonna talk about the common name because they have stories for them. And I'm not so good at pronouncing the Latin names, but it's important that they're there because that's more precise to use the scientific name. Of the 19 plants I'm gonna talk about, I have starred eight of them that are my top, top favorites. So this was a hard thing to make these choices, but I felt that would be helpful to you if I gave you my best, my best analysis of what I think are the, the best plants to grow. So we're gonna begin with the early bloomer category. So early bloomers are blooming now. This picture right here is what is going on in my garden right now. Some of these are what's called ephemerals. And ephemerals are truly magical in the native plant world. They appear very early, they bloom, they attract pollinators, they set seed and they die back all within six weeks to maybe two months time, very quickly. Their ideal habitat is under deciduous trees because they come up in response to the warmth of the sun. So they need to be under a tree where there's no leaves in the spring, but then they want to be under the shade of that tree once the leaves come out. So when you're thinking about what they want, think woods. They want to live in rich fertile soil and we can do that easily by leaving the leaves. We don't want to certainly blow them away with leaf blowers, which damage those insects that are living there and disturb the fertile soil that's um, developing. A little caveat is that these plants can be difficult to find for sale sometimes, some of these early bloomers, and especially the ephemerals. Frankly, I just think it's really hard to propagate ephemerals because they're ephemeral. They don't last a long time. And I've had trouble myself growing some of them because they die back and there's nothing then to sell. But I've included ones that you can still see while you're walking in natural areas in New Jersey. And it's magical to be able to find them. So I'm gonna begin with blood root. Blood root is my harbinger of spring. It even can, comes up earlier than the violet a little after skunk cabbage. It is called blood root because if you break the stem or dig up the roots, it will have a red sap. It blooms very, very early in, in March or April and the blooms last only a few days, but the unusual foliage lasts until midsummer. So here is the beginning of the blood root coming up and you can see how the leaf is furled around the stem. I think those look like candles, they look beautiful. And then you can see the beautiful fragile flower that blooms for just a few days. And then the gorgeous leaves. This is not necessarily considered an ephemeral because these leaves last until midsummer. This wants to be in shade um, and maybe a little part sun, but it would not do well in full sun. It's a fairly small plant. And the value of it is that um, mining bees are their primary pollinators. An interesting little fact about this plant is that it also can be self-pollinating because it blooms when it's still cool out. And so all these things to me are so magical. But if the plant is not pollinated after a few days because there's no insects out, it will self-pollinate. Another really interesting thing about this plant and about several other plants that are the early bloomers is that the ants disperse the seeds. So because the ants disperse the seeds, they don't get dispersed very far and they 
are really destroyed. The, the plants are destroyed when we develop um, our land for houses or for anything. I read a book this winter that said in the 1700s, bloodroot carpeted the forests of the Northeast. That of course is no longer true. It is very rare. In fact, this morning I got an email from a garden club in New Jersey that was auctioning off bloodroot plants in order to um, make money because they're so rare. But if you can get your hands on one, they're actually quite easy to grow. And I and myself want to be the Johnny or maybe the Ginny Appleseed of Bloodroot. So I have over the years taken the plants from the Briggs's orchard that I brought to my dad's garden and then brought them to here and then shared them. I first gave this talk five years ago and was able to share about 50 bloodroots with the master gardeners at that talk. So I urge us all to share the plants we have. This is the picture of the aleosome, which is the seeds of the bloodroot that the ants then take to eat because they're covered by really nutritious protein that's good for the ants and they take it back to their ant nest. They eat it, it goes through their digestive tract and then they um, can, uh, more bloodroot will come up. So that's just a really nifty thing. The next plant is Dutchman's breeches. It's called Dutchman's breeches because these little white flowers look like the pants that Dutchman wore in the colonial times, no longer. I'm a quarter Dutch. I'm glad I don't have to wear those pants. But they're blooming right now. They're beautiful, delicate flowers. And they're true. This is a truly ephemeral plant. It will totally die back in about six weeks. There will be no evidence that it was there except for some brown stems. This plant is most effectively pollinated by queen bumblebees who can get up, who have the strength um, to and the size to get up in there and pollinate it. So that's an example of a, re, a, a relationship between the plant and the bee. The next plant is May apple, and it is called May apple because in May it has a little flower that is under the leaf, um, and then that turns into a little fruit. But it's not an edible apple. It's poisonous, so please don't go try to eat it. This leaf is really, really large. So I sometimes think of that, this as an umbrella plant. This plant comes up now. This, I took this picture yesterday in my garden. So it's very large, but the, it's not May yet and the flowers are not out yet. It's a, a plant that loves shade and it does finding any kind of soil from dry to moist, although it will survive longer in the summer in a moist area. It creeps slowly by rhizomes. It really can cover a large area if you like it, if you want it to. And it um, nurtures a variety of spring pollinators. The really nifty fact about this plant is that it's twice as likely to germinate if it packs, passes through the digestive tract of a box turtle. So I'm always hoping that I'm going to have a box turtle in my yard, but I haven't had one yet. I also wanna say something about why it has large leaves. It's because plants that grow in the shade need larger leaves in order to capture more sun because they're in deep shade. So some of the ephemerals like um, Dutchman's Bridges doesn't need a large shade, a large leaf because it is um, going to be an ephemeral, but this one is going to persist longer, and that's one reason it has such a large leaf. The next plant, Spring Beauty, is one of the, the names I have in my title of my talk because it's both a plant, and these are all Spring Beauties. This is blooming right now, and it is an ephemeral. I call this plant easy to see, hard to grow at least for me. I've tried to grow it a few times, and this is an example, I think, of why plants that are ephemeral can be hard to grow because the bulb it comes from is so small. And then I plant it, and maybe I dig over it. I don't know exactly, but it doesn't work so well. However, this is a really easy plant to see when you're out in natural areas. And this morning I was walking with a dear friend and we saw hundreds of them on the grounds of our local high school. So they're very, they're very prevalent still, which is really special, especially because research has shown 
that these plants are the most likely flowers to be used by our native spring, our native spring bees. They visit them more than any other pollinator. And let me show you something really cool about that. These little pink stripes here are guides for the pollinators to show them where they can get into the, find the nectar and the pollen. So they're little landings, they're little landing strips for them. There's so much more you could say about this plant and a colleague of mine, Millie Ling in the Native Plant Society has written a long plant profile about this plant that you can see by visiting our website. The next plant, trout lily, is called trout lily because it has speckled leaves that look like the skin of trout, or maybe it was named because it has, because it grows near where trout uh, live in the streams. It is a plant that wants moist, um, a moist soil, although I have it growing here in a very dry place. And this was taken in a park near me in very moist soil. So it does, prepare, um, does, does prefer that. This is one of those plants that I mentioned is pollinated by specialist bees. So it has that special wildlife value and is also dis dispersed by forest ants. A mystery of this plant is that you can often see carpets of leaves and very few flowers. You see this picture here, I wanted to get more than one flower in and I really couldn't. So there's single leaves that make a big carpet of flowers, but it's rare to find the, the um, blooms. And there's not, uh, people are not sure why. They think maybe it's because there's too much deer there or maybe because um, it's too fertile. I don't know, if any of you know, and you wanna share it with us, it would be great. Virginia bluebells is a stunning plant and it is one of my star plants. So one of my eight favorites. It has, it's called Virginia bluebells because, well, here's a, a beautiful hill of it in Virginia. And because the flowers look like bluebells, of course, they're very unusual because they start out pink and kind of then fade to blue into this beautiful blue that one of my favorite garden writers, William Kalina wrote, are like delicate clumps of sky sent here a few weeks each year to bring us closer to heaven. And this is just a stunning gardening plant. So if you can find it for sale and later on, I'll give you some hints of where you can find it. I urge you to put it in your garden because it is hard to purchase, hard to find, but very easy to grow. And it grows in nice clumps. It's an ephemeral, so when you grow it, you wanna mark where it is in your garden because you won't be able to keep track of it otherwise. It needs light shade like all of these plants and is very flexible on soil. White trillium is another of my favorites. It's another starred plant. It's called trillium because it has three petals and three leaves, so it's like a triangle. It is um, just a gorgeous plant that um, is breathtaking, I think. I first saw this plant when I was a little girl in that orchard, and I used to pick violets for my mom, and she was always happy when I would come home. I'd pick her big bunches of violets. But one day, I found this plant. And I came home with Trillium and she gently chastised me and told me, you shouldn't have picked that. This is a rare plant and it hurts the plant to pick it. So years later, when they were taking down the orchard, I remembered where that patch of Trillium was and went there with my dad and we dug it out. And that Trillium lives in my garden now. So my mom, thank you, mom, for teaching me about Trillium. That's probably why I remembered where it was. This is worth growing because it is such a gorgeous white illumination in the garden and it has a nice long bloom time and the flowers after they bloom for a while as white become, they fade to pink, which is very interesting. It has a clumping habit. So it mean, that means that it's not gonna spread too much. Anyway, people want trillium to spread. It's a little hard to propagate from seed, but very easy to grow once you have a plant and the plants will last a long time. They say 25 years to a century. So I think that's long enough for any of us. And once you have it, you can divide it. One thing I do is when I, in the spring sometimes before they bloom, I will dig them up 
and gently, while I talk to them, separate out the clumps and there's little side bulbs and then I can divide them and spread them around and give them to people. And then each new plant will become a new clump. So it is actually hard to grow from seed, but not so hard to divide. So I've been mentioned a few times, well, this is hard to find or that is hard to find. So let's drill down with that. Here's a slide right now. Sometimes I put these at the end about where you can buy these plants. Each place I've listed on this slide sells at least seven of the plants that I'm talking about tonight. And I've bought plants from all of them except for Summer Sweet and a good friend recommends that. So I know they're all great places. Randy Echo, the host for tonight, she owns Toad Shade Wildflower and that's a great place. So the first three are ones that are mostly mail order and they are exclusively native. The pollination sells plugs. And what does a plug mean? Some people may, may not be familiar. That means that it's a small plant that you can buy very inexpensively, usually for about $3. And so it's a great place to know about in case you wanna buy a lot of plants. Well Sweet Herb Farm is kind of in its own category. It's a family business that's been there for about 50 years. And they sell, of course, herbs and vegetables, and they really have a big selection of spring plants too. And then the last three are native nurseries that are regular places to go. They don't do meal order. And Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, I recommend to you to go to see these plants. It's a beautiful place to go. It's a wildflower preserve and also is a nursery. And then Gino's Nursery and Summer Suite are other places that you can go. Um, Summer Suite is by appointment. Before I finish, move on, I want to say something that um, Mara McClellan, who works at Gino's Nursery, said to me last week when I was talking to her about what plants she had. And she said, you know, I hope that soon finding native plants is going to be like finding organic carrots. 20 years ago, it was really hard to buy an organic carrot. You had to go to a specialty store and now they're everywhere. So it's kind of that we have to ask for them. We have to demand it. And then hopefully the market will respond and it'll be a little easier to find the native plants. But for now, I hope that this is helpful. So now we're gonna go to my garden category of the things that I think are garden beauties. These are a little easier to buy than those early bloomers. They bloom a little later. Some, most of them tolerate a little more sun. And I want us to consider planting them because I think they're as beautiful as daffodils or tulips that many of us have and that we should then consider adding these to our gardens too. The first one is Columbine and the second one is Golden Alexander. And those two are my absolute top two. So you might think, oh, Deb, you have your 19, then you have your eight, then you have your two. I hope it's, I hope it's not crazy making and that it's helpful. But for someone who's new to this, to plant Columbine and Golden Alexander would be my top two recommendations. So Columbine is so such a gorgeous plant. It waves in the wind and it grows anywhere basically. It says rich or poor, dry, rocky soil, basically anywhere except a rain garden. It doesn't want to be an overly moist soil. It's also really easy once you have it to increase it because the flowers, once they die, they have little black seeds inside and you can just shake them around. And I do that and some of them take and become more plants. This flower um, provides nectar for butterflies, but more importantly and more kind of excitingly is for hummingbirds. Hummingbirds love red tubular flowers like this and their long tongues can get up in there. Another plant um, animal uh, interaction. So it's some people say that the blooming of the columbine corresponds to the northward migration of the hummingbirds. So maybe you'll be lucky if you plant columbine and you'll get to see hummingbirds in your garden. The foliage stays really nice until autumn, although sometimes leaf miners can tunnel in and make, um, make holes and make lines on it. And this is a good point to talk about pests in native plants. We're growing native plants because we want the animals to use them. 
So you're going to find holes if you plant native plants. And that's okay. Doug Tallamy says, just take a 10 foot step back and you won't see the holes. But to me, if there's holes in my plants, that's good. And then the other thing is the question of insects. There's going to be insects. We want them. And people sometimes don't want the bad insects. My theory is let the bad ones be eaten by the beneficial ones. Let them fight it out. And I don't have to do anything. If you do want to do something, you can do non-chemical things like soapy water spray. And you can easily research how to do it. But I, we don't want to use pesticides because we're trying to invite animal life into our gardens. My next top two plant is golden alexander. And there's two kinds of golden alexander that I want to talk about. They're both straight species. They're both totally native. The top one is Zizia aptera heart leaf, and it has little heart-shaped leaves. It's a little bit more delicate than the other than the bottom one, Zizia aurea. And Zizia aurea spreads more rapidly and is a little taller. They both can grow in quite a bit of sun to shade, and they're very tolerant of a variety of soils. They are a host plant for the black swallowtail, which is the state butterfly of New Jersey. And they also serve many other functions, as you can see, as such as being nectar for pollen for specialist bees. They're very easy. Both Columbine and Golden Alexander are very easy to find for purchase. And the bees, small bees particularly like this plant because it's, it's a small little plant. And so it's a good one for small bees. This next plant is called Bowman's Root. And that reminds us that many of these plants have medicinal values. This one they think was called Bowman's Root because it was used, the, a, a man who used bows used the root medicinally. It actually has two common names or two sign, and two scientific names, so that's a bit confusing. Um, and this is a very underused plant. So this might be the plant for those of you who have a lot of these native plants. Interestingly, it is received, it has received the Award of Garden Merit from the Royal Horticultural Society in London. Sometimes I think that people in Europe appreciate our native plants more than we do. So this I commend to you if you don't have it. It's a, I call it fairy flowers, these beautiful flowers, and the foliage stays gorgeous all season and then it becomes red. It's also a little taller. It almost has a shrub-like habit. Um, and you'll notice I put thrives on neglect, so it's really easy care. Goat's beard is a great plant for, um, the, and for the shade as an anchor plant because you can see it gets four to six feet tall. It's named goat's beard because its flowers look like the beard of a goat. These flower names I love. And it's really provides a nice statuesque um, focal point in the garden. I've grown it for a long time and it's great because it's just one plant. It doesn't, I have a small space, so I'm glad when the plants don't reproduce too much sometimes. Of course, the goal of plants is to reproduce. They want to, to set their seed and share it in other places, but some are less rambunctious than others and that's goat's beard. It's a tremendous source of pollen and nectar and it's a host for one of our native butterflies. Now we come to Jacob's Ladder. So that name is because the leaves look like a little ladder. And in the Old Testament, Jacob had a vision of a ladder coming down from heaven. It is a beautiful, well-behaved garden plant. It's not rambunctious. And I think it looks really nice with other spring plants. Here are some yellow violets in Jacob's Ladder from last year year. It's not quite in bloom yet. It has beautiful foliage and it's nectar for specialist bees and others. And it grows in any kind of um, moist soil or, or any kind of soil, but it can be it take very moist. The wild geranium is one of my top eight plants. This is not the geranium that you're used to that you would find in the red geranium that you would find available every spring. This is a perennial native geranium. 
and it's very valuable. Um, it's very valuable ecologically. It's like all the others that it can grow in shade to part sun. And it's blooming a little bit later than now. The leaves are up, but it's not blooming quite yet. It's very adaptable. And it's one of Professor Ptolemy's top 10 flowers, not just spring flowers, but flowering plants because it's a host for 23 different species of small butterflies. So that's a large number of plants, of butterflies to be a host for. You can, it kind of like Spring Beauty also has, you can see these little stripes here. It has little nectar guides for the pollinators to find their way to the pollen. So that's a really nifty feature of the geranium, of the wild geranium. This is a, another picture of a, a clump of wild geraniums. You might think, well, this could be a ground cover and it could be, except that the leaves don't necessarily persist into the fall, but they look beautiful for a long time. And now we come to the last of the garden beauties, which is wild bleeding heart. I love this plant and this plant is a little hard to find, but more of us should be asking for it. You can see why it's called bleeding heart because it looks like a little heart and actually the tips look like it's bleeding. It's beautiful for the flower and it's beautiful for the foliage and it's incredible. It blooms more than 200 days. It is blooming now. There's a vase of it behind me and it will bloom until November. I took a picture of it blooming on November 11th last year. It is very flexible about the sun, although not full sun, but it can, it can live in shade to part sun. And it's um, nectar for bees, it's deer resistant. It's a great ground cover because it lasts so long and has such pretty foliage. So let's talk about ground covers for a minute. Why do I put things into the category of ground cover? Because ground covers are something people want we need to cover the ground. And many ground covers that are used are very invasive, like English ivy. English ivy, it breaks my heart when I walk in natural areas of New Jersey and uh, in many, many parks or preserves. It's full of English ivy and they're choking, it's choking the trees. So I want to um, give you some ideas of ground covers, spring flowers that can also be uh, ground covers. So the first one is coral bells. Coral bells is named because the blooms look like little bells. It blooms a little bit in late spring and it's like all the others in terms of the shade. It likes part shade and a little part sun. It supports the specialist bees and the leaves turn kind of purple or red but stay throughout the winter. I have a nice patch of coral bells and the leaves really persist all through the winter. So it's a really nice thing to consider for a ground cover. The next one is foam flower. And you can see why it's called foam flower. It looks foamy. This one also has beautiful leaves and like coral bells, the leaves turn color through the season. Um, and it can say it stays evergreen. It might die back more if it's a really hard winter. It serves specialist bees. And I have not had quite as good a luck with this plant as with coral bells and becoming and spreading. I, this is a plant I wish would spread more. So I've recently learned that if you want it to spread more, it's better to have it in a moister area. So that's a good thing to know if you would like it to spread. And it's a gorgeous, gorgeous spring plant as well as a ground cover. My final ground cover is golden ragwort, Packer aurea. This is a new plant for me. Um, I am, have just planted it in a place where I used to have a non-native tree that I had taken out. It's beginning to bloom now, so I want to note that it has a really long bloom time. That's a really nice reason to grow it. Look at that, three months. Um, when you have perennial gardening, as you do with native gardening, all natives are, mostly all are perennials, it's helpful to have some plants that bloom longer because none of them are going to bloom all summer. This is also very tolerant of sun, which is nice that sun to shade, very tolerant of all types of soil. And it's a host plant for butterflies and nectar for the specialist bees. And it's strongly evergreen. 
Friends who have told me about this and who have grown it for longer than I have suggest that you cut off the flowers after they bloom and then it's just a mat of evergreen. So I think that's a great idea. For those of you who are newer to gardening, I wanted to have this slide to say, how many should we buy? And how, how should we plant, space them? I recommend always buying in groups of three. Three, the rule of three is a nice design rule and you have a little insurance in case they, um, in case something dies. And then in terms of spacing, you can, you can look that up. So for my new golden ragwort, I looked it up and it said to plant 18 inches apart. So that's what I did. Of course, it depends on how big an area you want to cover and uh, how you space it and how many you buy. But it's helpful to at least start with the rule of three and to think about the spacing and do a little research into how fast it grows. This particular um, plant will grow by both seeds and undergrown rhizomes, so I know it's going to spread pretty well. And I like to remember this little poem, first year they leap, sleep, second year they leap, they creep, third year they leap. And that's really true and sometimes means we should be a little patient and put a little mulch down while they're developing. So now there's the picture I started with again, and now you know all these plants. They too can be your friends. We have the Virginia bluebells, the leaves of the bloodroot, the beautiful blossoms and leaves of golden Alexander. Back there's a trillium that I probably had recently um, divided and put back there. The foam flower that I wish was bigger, the wild bleeding heart that I love and I put everywhere. You can see I put it up there too and my little patch of violets for salad and beauty and butterflies. So we're going, the last category is rain garden plants. And you may think, wow, I thought those were fall plants. This looks like milkweed and Joe pie weed and turtle head and winterberry holly. And yes, even non-native hydrangeas. And yes, that's true. This is a rain garden in September near my sump pump just to remind us that our gardens will become, our native gardens will become more than just the spring flowers. But here's what it looks, that same area looks like right now. It looks like this. This picture was taken through the branches of that winterberry holly. So the marsh marigold, the name says it all. It grows in marshy areas. Literally my sump pump dumps all kinds of water here and it thrives. And it's marigold not in, it's not a marigold like we know marigolds, but it is beautiful, beautiful gold. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a joy to behold this yellow, it's bright yellow. And it has a long bloom time you can see from April to June. So it's in bloom like this right now and will continue to bloom. It's a great reason to grow it. Its value is early nectar. Like many of these plants, it's deer resistant. And the, this is also a very cool plant about the bees. We see this as bright yellow, almost you know, neon yellow. The bees see that as purple and they see more than one color. So it helps to guide them into the center to get the pollen. So that's a great, great plant if you have a wet area. I live in a flood zone, so I'm really happy to have that plant. This is a good time to talk briefly about invasives and to shop and to research before you go shopping. Here's an invasive that you will see if you're walking in New Jersey's natural areas right now called Lesser Celandine. This was taken in my neighbor's yard, this picture. Her backyard is full of Lesser Celandine because many years ago, her brother, who was an environmentalist, told her to buy it. But we all live and learn so I wanna make sure you know, if you see that in the woods, it's something to be a little sad about. And you can see that it's often drowning out, for example, the trout lily. I've also listed a few other invasives that are still sold in New Jersey, like English ivy, Japanese honeysuckle, barberry, privet bush, butterfly bush, Japanese maple. And I put down the link for the New Jersey Strike Team Task Force if you're more interested, if you're interested in finding out more about invasive plants. Please don't buy them. And if you can, take them out of your um, property. Our last flower to talk about tonight and another starred one is the blue flag iris. So iris is named 
for the Greek goddess of the rainbow. And no wonder, it's such a gorgeous plant. Many people love irises. And the irises that we're most familiar with, most of them are not native, but this is a beautiful, beautiful native iris that grows in right near my sump pump also. It can grow in very moist and is a great rain garden plant. It blooms a little bit later in May to June. And it is a plant you'll see that really wants sun. I don't say shade here, it wants sun to part sun. It's a little bit taller, two to three feet, and it's a host for the Virginia Satunic moth and another plant that, that hummingbirds like to go to. So that's another great reason to um, grow that plant and very deer resistant. So we're coming to near the end of the hour and then near the end of my presentation. Here's a slide you might wanna take a picture of. These are my favorite spring friends, my eight favorites. And for three of them, I have listed the nurseries that actually have them. One of my friends is saying to me, you know, it's frustrating to hear about great plants and then not be able to find them. And I thought that was a really good point. So I made some phone calls. And at least as of today, these plants like Virginia bluebell and white trillium and wild bleeding heart can be found at these nurseries. For white trillium, I mentioned a, uh, not a nursery but a historic garden in our town in Montclair that's having a plant sale next weekend, not this weekend. And they are going to have white trillium there. And that's a good thing to say, to actually investigate plant sales, because that's another good source of natives um, and spring natives that you may be able to find in your area, wherever you are. So, I wanna talk for a minute about tips to care for our native habitats. These tips apply to the spring plants and to all plants. First, of course, is to plant the right place in the, the right plant in the right place. As we've seen tonight, many natives are flexible on light, moisture, and soil, but it's still better to pay attention to where they want to be. Water well the first season so they get established, but what's amazing is you don't need to water after that because no one's watering the fields, no one's watering the woods. You can let mother nature water. And if there is a drought, they will withstand that. They might look a little peaked, but they'll come back. Then we wanna protect the pollinator habit, habitat that we're trying to invite into our yards by leaving the leaves. Remember the leaves make rich soil. So leave that leaf litter it's free natural fertilizer for you and it's a home for the insects. Speaking of home for the insects, we also want to leave our perennials standing until the spring because many insects overwinter in perennial plants. So wait till these have several days of above 50 degree temperatures before you clean up the garden and you don't need to clean up the garden in the fall. Leave it so it's a habitat. As we've said before, eradicate or reduce the invasive plants if you can, and please don't use pesticides. There's no such thing as a pesticide that only kills one kind of insects. It will kill all the insects. If you want to learn more, here's a few websites. Of course, our Native Plant Society website is a great source of information. And then the next two, the National Wildlife Federation and Audubon Society, have very wonderful features of plant finders where you can put your zip code in and look for native plants for your area. I've also listed two plant ID apps and two books. Um, Douglas, Douglas Talony, as I mentioned, has written many books. And then I love William Kalina's book. It's very encyclopedia, encyclopedia. I'm not gonna try again with that word. And it's really good about propagating plants. It's excellent on that. So, Rachel Carson said that those who dwell among the beautiful and mysteries of the earth are never alone or weary of life. She was an early environmentalist and we can help the environment on this eve of Earth Day by planting the plants that nurture the animals. And then the, the, we will be helping nature to cultivate relationships and giving ourselves beautiful Edens in our backyards. As my husband always says, our little backyard is a paradise 
because of all the butterflies and birds that come there. Here's a magnificent Eastern tiger swallowtail on a button bush in July. So we begin, I began by looking back 50, more than 50 years ago to my parents giving me a love of native plants. And I want to end by looking more than 50 years into the future. These are the hands of the grandchildren of Dina Corbin, a friend of mine and a colleague on the Essex Chapter Steering Committee. And Dina is fantastic about teaching young people in Newark about native plants. And her grandchildren here are holding milkweed seeds. So my request to all of you, whether or not you have a garden, is to take what you've learned tonight and share it with someone else because together we can build a movement. We can heal Mother Earth one plant at a time. Thank you so much for your attention tonight, for being here, and we're now going to go to Randy for questions and a close. Thank you so much, Deb. We've, we've been having a lot of comments coming in, in the, uh, through chat, thanking you for an excellent presentation and commenting on your beautiful photos. Um, and um, lots and lots of great comments. Um, before we get on to the questions, I do want to put in a plug for next month's uh, when, Wednesday webinar, wow. um, which will be Wednesday, May 5th at 7 p.m. We're going to hear from Marianne Borg. Uh, talking about native plants, spread, spreading the word beyond the choir. Uh, Marianne is another excellent speaker and excellent photographer, and I think you will all very much enjoy that presentation. So please go to mpsnj.org and, uh, and register for that webinar. It promises to be a very good one. Uh, but now that I've given a plug for Marianne, let's get on to some of the questions uh, that folks pose to you, Deb. Um, We've had a lot of really interesting questions, both very specific and very broad. But one of the very first ones um, uh, that I wanted to bring up uh, may have been the first question that was posed. Someone was, you were talking about um, uh, rescuing uh, the trilliums and some other plants from the, um, the apple orchard uh, when you grew up. And the question was, about the ethics of harvesting wild plants from stable populations and whether or not, you know, both the ethics and the legality of it. Um, you know, the person who wrote the question said, well, I know we can't take them from state parks, but what about state forests and county and city parks? Um, what, what are your thoughts on the ethics of, I have thoughts, but you're the presenter this evening. What are your thoughts on the ethics of that sort of uh, collecting? So first of all, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear enough. I dug those up when the apple orchard was going to be destroyed. So it was private property. And I, I did mention two different times. One time we dug things up from the large garden that Mr. and Mrs. Briggs had when they called the neighbors and invited us to come and dig up the garden before it was destroyed. And the other time, it was a similar in time, but it was a, the trilliums were in a part of the orchard that I went and dug them up when the orchard was going to be destroyed and the whole thing would be destroyed. So I think that was a very unusual and specific situation. Normally, if you're gonna take plants from private property, you would seek the owner's permission. And in this case, I had the owner's permission for both of them. We do not want as native plant enthusiasts to take plants from the wild, whether it's from state forests or state parks or anywhere, because just imagine if we did that. If we each did that, there were over 500 people just on this webinar tonight. If, we, if 500 people go into a natural area and dig out something, then um, it won't be there for other generations to enjoy. So no, we do not want to do that. And I'm sorry if I wasn't clear enough about my orchard digging experience. Well, that was that question did come in very, very early. And I think you did address it as it went on. But but I did want to thought that was an important one to cover. It's Someone very else piggybacked on that. Actually, uh, when we were talking about you were talking about invasive species, um, the ethics of when you're hiking on public land and there are invasive species such as vines that are destroying plants. 
should should the average hiker try to go managing those while they're on public lands? Well, I would defer to you as more of an expert, but I was hiking with a friend on Saturday and she started pulling out barberry bushes. And I was very impressed with that she did that. She knows what she's doing. Um, but it's, I said, we're not going to get very far if you keep pulling out every barberry bush. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think most people are going to go do that. Um, to me, I think that it would be good if you, I mean, there's a lot of groups that are organized to try to eradicate invasive plants. I don't know if there's anything bad about doing it on your own. Maybe you have an opinion. Well, I, I think usually it's better done in a more organized way. One of the things that can be misconstrued is folks that are hiking that may not know the difference between invasives and natives might think that it's, if they see someone, however well-intentioned going through removing invasives, they may not realize um, uh, if you're doing that and you see someone, you should explain to them what they're doing, but you should always let the park or managing group understand what you're doing. Um, I have certainly gone on some, some invasive species uh, removals uh, with uh, volunteers, old and young. Um, and the very first thing you start with is education so that they, they, they understand exactly what they're doing and, and how to do it. Sounds good to me. Um, now here's, here's an easy one, does skunk cabbage smell bad? Yes, it does. <laughs> it smells bad to attract those flies and the leaves even smell bad. In fact, sometimes you can find it by the smell. Um, so yes, it does smell bad. It smells like a skunk. I was not sure the other day actually whether something I was seeing was skunk cabbage or not. And so I smeared, I, I broke it in the leaf in half and smeared it on my hand and <laughs> and had my friend I was hiking with smell and she goes that smells horrible but at the same time I have seen it used in gardens and it doesn't make the entire garden waft no. of of skunk only if you walk through it and crush the leaves and cause some trouble it's not terrible no it's not a reason not to have it in your garden if you want to have it in your garden yeah but if you walk through it and break the leaves you'll know <laughs> um let's see here Oh, very early on, you were showing a beautiful woodland garden of yours. Um, there was a question as to whether or not any of those plants have trouble coming up through wood chips or mulch. Great question. No, they don't. Um, especially, I want to answer the question a little differently. They don't have trouble coming up through leaves because um, I have worked to minimize the use of leaf blower, gas powered leaf blowers in our town and to try to educate people to leave leaves because it's better for the environment. And so I actually have pictures of a blood root poking up through the leaves and they will, they're will they fine to poke up. They may not be able to poke up through inches and inches and inches of mulch, I don't know, because I, don't, I try to minimize my use of mulch and use leaves as mulch and as fertilizer. That's the great thing about leaves, they're both mulch and fertilizer. So I th the, they definitely can, um, come up. And then there were patches on that picture that didn't have any um, flowers. And of course, that's for other, other flowers are planted there that will come up later in the summer and fall. Well, that, that leads right into another question that someone posed, actually, uh, which I think you did address when you were talking about the rain gardens at the end. Um, someone was asking, you know, if you have these spring ephemerals that are there and then they disappear, do you plant something to take over that space when the ephemerals have gone by, or do you leave that area blank? I do plant something over it, near it. So it's kind of um, an interesting little design challenge, but not too, too much of a challenge. It's just you have to think about planting another plant nearby where the ephemeral is so that it will get bigger as ephemeral dies back. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think, important to mark the ephemeral. So I, want, I usually try to have a sign where I have my Dutchman's breeches or my Virginia bluebells, especially because I'm often trying to cram too many things into my garden and I'm afraid that I'm going to uh, plant over it, which I think is what I've done with spring beauties, why I haven't had the <laughs> um, Yeah, remembering where the plants are is always a, a challenge for any gardener, I think. Um, I have a great neighbor who knows more than I do. So when I'm not sure what something is coming up in the spring, you say, hey, John, come, can you come over to my yard and tell me what this is? But not everyone has a John Susquich across the street. <laughs> there were a couple of really interesting questions, which I'm going to sort of all combine into one, where people were asking about plant ranges. Um, 
there was someone from Northern Bergen County that said they'd seen uh, just a few, I think recently they'd seen a lot of these wildflowers when they were, I think in Ohio, they said, and some other folks asked about ranges as well. Um, can you speak to some places where people might find out what the ranges are of some of these native plants? Uh, where Are violets native to New York was another question. How do you find out about the ranges of some of these plants and where they actually are native? So funny that you should ask me that question, Randy, because I did a lot of research to make sure that every plant in this presentation was a New Jersey native. And I realized I actually forgot to say that. So for everyone who's still here, every plant in that presentation was a New Jersey native. And I wasn't sure. I was still trying to figure that out last week. And you told me about a great resource called BONAP, B-O-N as in Nancy, A-P. And that's the bio, Biota Data Something. Biota of North America Project. Great, thank you. And that's a great thing because then you can look and see exactly where a plant is native to and, and um, how rare it is and what counties even. So many of the plants though that I talked about, I can tell you from my own knowledge, are native pretty much to the Northeast, not just to New Jersey. So I'm, I don't know 100%, but I would make a strong guess that violets are native to New York. To answer that question. And I think many of these plants are native to Ohio, especially because my first knowledge and love of them came from growing up in Wisconsin and they were native to Wisconsin. One of the th fun things that I used to do, just a real quick aside, um, uh, I lived in North Carolina for a while and it was sort of fun to be able to come north and visit family and sort of follow spring. You know, it wasn't that all the wonderful spring ephemerals were in North Carolina, they just start earlier. <laughs> so we would, we would move north. And so the bloom time would vary. Like in Wisconsin, the bloom time would be a little bit later. But the bloom time can actually vary a lot, even based on what side of the street you're on. So my neighbor's Virginia bluebells are almost done blooming. And mine had just started because his garden is sunnier. He's on the sunny side of the street. There've been a lot of questions about uh, various different invasives, um, how to, well, one question that came up, uh, someone has a large woodland area and they've been trying to manage it and get rid of the garlic mustard and get rid of the uh, Japanese stilt grass. And the question has come up, what should they put in its place? Uh, um, as, as a as, as satisfying as it can be to rip out all the invasives, it's nice to put something in its place. Um, are, there, are there any woodland plants, spring woodland plants that you can think of that would get a really good head start um, on those particular invasives? So for that, I'd really recommend using some of the plants I mentioned that are the most aggressive or that really spread quickly. And a good example would be the mayapple. Mayapple spreads um, quite quickly through underground roots. And I would put, I would start, I'd buy a few and put them in different places so each one would form a clump. Um, and so I think that would be a really good one. Another really good one would be the Golden Alexander, the mm -hmm. Zizia aurora, because it also spreads quite quickly. For my taste in my small garden, a little bit too quickly. So again, that would be a good one for a woodland garden. Another one would be violets and put them in different places so that each one will be then spreading. So anything that spreads quickly would be um, good ideas to put there. And that is also a good thing to do. I think um, the question is a smart one because if you're gonna remove invasives, it's very important then to have something else to replace it with. Yeah. Um, so three examples, I think, of things that move quickly. Yes, yes. Um, the There was another question about um, the lesser celandine. Do you have any experience trying to, uh, to battle that? I don't. I'm sorry, I'm not an expert on that. Um, the only thing I am being careful of is if I see a couple in my garden to bring, to take them out because there's so many in my neighbor's yard mm -hmm. and it's moving that neighbor's two houses from me. It's moving to the house between us. There's quite a lot of it. So I'm afraid of it coming here. I haven't researched how to get rid of it. I more wanted people to know about it so that they were aware of it, you know? And, yeah. and I think it's definitely easier to get out a small infestation than a bigger infestation. 
but always, always. Um, One thing I is do know there, of it, so you can then, if you have a little bit, get rid of it. And once there's a heavy infestation, they're very difficult to remove. They produce so many little bulbules in the soil. Um, very difficult. There is a, a individual that we've been in, I've been in contact with this year, and they're actually trying to, they have a very heavily infested area. They're trying to use a flame weeder um, to uh, knock them back. And uh, it remains to be seen how that works. She tells me that um, she's on her second year of working on that. She thinks that there are less there this year than there were last year. So she's hopeful that maybe this is an approach, but uh, the jury's still out on that one. Um, let's see. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, here's a great question. Um, how do you prepare your leaves for mulching? Uh, do you just rake them in? Do you shred them? Can you have too many leaves? Um, uh, what's a person to do? So for me, sometimes I call myself a lazy gardener. I do nothing. I just put them there and just kind of push them up with a rake or my hands. I think it's better to shred them. So if you have a shredder, that would be great. I don't have a shredder. I thought of taking my leaves to a friend who has a shredder or bringing her shredder to my yard, but I've never done it. Actually, Deb, uh, there's a lot of insect poop that um, they drop from the trees and they will, well, over they will overwinter in the leaves. So if you shred them up, you may destroy a lot of insects that are gonna overwinter there. Well, I was going to say that if you're shredding them right in the beginning, that's what I was thinking. But so see, again, it's better to be lazy. So it, is better, it absolutely is better to be lazy. Right. I don't you shred know, them. Um, nobody, nobody goes through our forests with a shredder and shreds up all the leaves Perfect. for us. It doesn't happen. Right. Um, so you don't shred them. And I think that um, I, I guess theoretically you could have too many leaves. But again, I always think use nature, Mother Nature as a guide. There's not too many leaves in the forest. No one's going cleaning out the excess leaves. And, and so was a question about oak leaves in particular, because they can be large and, and a little bit plate like. Um, and I think you can um, you can manage them a little bit by raking them in areas where you don't have very tender um, uh, ephemerals, for example, trying to come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it depends on the situation, like most things. If there's two, sometimes some of my leaves get blown away and I actually take leaves and put them in another part of the garden where they blew away. So, you know, you don't want probably two feet of leaves, obviously. <laughs> well, not unless you're trying to smother Japanese stilt grass. <laughs> right. That's a great way to smother Japanese stilt grass. I, I um, will say though that like, you know, I've piled up leaves pretty high in the fall and by the spring, you know, feet of leaves can go down to inches of leaves. Oh, absolutely. They, they decompose and they really compress down. Like compost. Particularly after a good snow year where we have snow compaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see, there was a question about, oh, um, when can you plant native plants? Can you plant them anytime during the summer? Is the spring best? Is the fall best? When, when do you like to plant? So I think for most people would say the spring or the fall. Spring being up till June. I mean, since Randy, you own a nursery, you're, of course, the, my, my little trick here was to have you be the host so that any question I don't know the answer to, you know the answer to, and this is working very well. So um, spring plants, this is a good time to grow them, to plant them. Some of them are already too hard to find like Virginia bluebells, but, and then the reason to not plant them in the heat of the summer is it just takes too much water to get them established. It's too stressful to them. And then it's good to start planting them again in September and October is the rule I live by. But tell me if you think I'm wrong. Well, it's really a, um, I, I too am a lazy gardener. <laughs> um, so yes, it is easier to plant them in the spring and fall. You can plant them in the summer. You just need to take a little extra care and make sure they have plenty of moisture until they get well established. So it's really, um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I tell people is landscapers don't take the summer off and stop putting in landscapes. They keep planting all summer long. They, you just need to put in a little bit more care. For those of us lazy gardeners like you and me, Deb, spring and fall are, are the easiest time to do it. Right, because I'm not gonna water. 
Yes. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I did that when uh, management. Uh, oh, someone asked, they came in late um, and I meant to mention this earlier, but yes, this is being recorded um, and you'll be able to go back to the MPSNJ website and uh, see it all over again and, and look back at Deb's slides and figure out what you missed. Uh, they were in another meeting and they came in too late. Um, someone asked about asters. Uh, even though this was a spring talk, do you have any favorite asters that you keep in your garden? I do. I really like the white woodland aster. Mm -hmm. And I also have the New England aster. I, so I have the white woodland aster, as might be expected, in my shade garden, like where I would have my spring flowers. And then in the sunny front, I have New England aster. Asters are great plants um, for supporting butterflies and moths. They're the number two plant, number two flower, flowering plant, according to Doug Tallamy. And they're really cool. Here's the nifty thing about uh, asters because they are, their center changes from yellow to red when the pollen's been taken. It's like a red stop sign to the insect. Don't come here. We've already been used up. And that's particularly noticeable in the white woodland aster. Very good, very good. Uh, any other favorite natives that you want to throw into the mix while you're talking about your asters? You were you were limited to spring, Deb, so this is your opportunity. I tell people it's like trying to pick a favorite child. How do you do that? And anything else that you want to uh, to mention? I have many. I have the same problem that you do. It's hard to pick the favorites. I did a lot of work picking favorites for this. I think I'm worn out on that. But um, I guess you know that I love wreath goldenrod. So goldenrod is the number one flowering plant, um, according to Doug Tallamy, and supporting, um, supporting moths and butterflies. The goldenrod is a species. And wreath goldenrod is particularly nice because it can grow in the shade. I now have wreath goldenrod where I used to have hostas in some of those pictures that are from a couple of years ago. So um, I think it's a good one to mention since a lot, all of these plants were all of them except iris basically could grow in the shade. So yes, um, wreath goldenrod is a great summer shade plant. Nice. And goldenrod in general is a great plant to grow in your garden. There, my philosophy is there's a goldenrod for every garden. Yes. I have a chart of goldenrod, Absolutely. but that's Absolutely. another webinar. <laughs> um, it'll be a very yellow webinar. Um, <laughs> A couple uh, more questions about some managing some invasives. Uh, do you want to take the invasive insects or the invasive plant first, Deb? Your choice. What, I, I'm not an expert on managing invasive insects, so you can ask me the question. I probably don't know the answer. Well, we'll go with the English ivy then. Um, do you have experience uh, removing English ivy? And have oh, any do I have experience removing English ivy? When I <laughs> moved into my uh, property, it was all English ivy, except for a few bushes, uh, some non-native irises, which are gorgeous. Montclair has the world's largest iris garden, so that's like a normal thing to have irises. And some of those bleeding hearts, some of the wild bleeding hearts were there. So I went through a difficult period in my life when I moved into my house that was not based on moving into the house. And um, I went to therapy for a while and then after a while I said, I think I'm doing okay and I can't afford more therapy and I'm going to pull English ivy for therapy. <laughs> and I did that for a couple of years. Uh, the English ivy roots are terrible, terrible, terrible. I made my son when he was only 10 vow that he would never plant English ivy. I never asked my other, my daughter to do that. But um, so the best thing for English ivy is not to plant it. And I don't know another way to get out of it other than to dig and dig and dig. And it's yeah. very persistent. It's very persistent. My experience as well. Mm -hmm. I now rarely have English ivy coming up, but it, it's in the neighboring yards. And I live, you know, I have a very small property. And so it is always coming back. We've got time for just a few more questions. Um, there was um, a couple questions. One early on in your presentation, when you were talking about the violets, which um, as you well know, I'm very fond of as well. Um, they wanted to know if only the common blue violet was a host plant to the fritillaries or if all violets 
our host plant to the fritillaries? I don't know the answer to that question, but I bet you do, Randy, as an entomologist. All violets, all violets. Um, <laughs> so, so. I think so, uh, just go with certainty because I knew you'd know it. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're the speaker. I figured I'd throw it out to you first. Um, but another question someone was asking about uh, columbines. They, uh, years ago, they planted some columbines in their garden that we, they were told were wild columbines, um, but were not red and yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and there certainly are lots and lots of different colors of columbines on the market. Are they all natives, the question? That's a great question. If, you know, I probably could have talked for two hours about this and that's something I thought of saying and decided I didn't have time for it that columbines are probably hybridized as much as any other plant. There's all kinds of colors of columbines and they're beautiful. And there's even other native columbines. Colorado has uh, the state flower is columbine and it's a purple and white columbine. So this is a good question. Um, the columbine that is native to the Eastern United States is that red and yellow one. And I was just looking at a plant cell list where someone had a yellow columbine. And I thought, why are we even doing that? Because the hummingbirds want the red tubular flowers. That's what they're attracted to. So let's just stick with the beautiful native columbine, which is the red and yellow. And that's also a good time to, I think, say the word wild is squishy word. Um, so when I was a little girl, we called these wildflowers. I have books from um, when I was a kid about native wild, or not a native, just wildflowers, wildflowers in the United States. But wildflowers can be, include things that are so invasive that they're everywhere, like Queen Anne's lace. It's, it's introduced and it's everywhere. Um, I don't know if it's technically an invasive here, but um, so I think that's the thing. Wild <laughs> is not a precise term. The, what we should use is the term natives. So. So anyway, with the columbine, I agree that some of the others are beautiful, but I think our native one is really gorgeous. I love the two-tone color. No, it is gorgeous. And it, and it does um, certainly herald the arrival of the, uh, of the hummingbirds in our area. Uh, there was another question about um, a little uh, possibly uh, plant ID question really. Um, Someone was asking if the little mini strawberry that's all over the place, should we be ripping that out? Um, and I think they were probably talking about Indian mock strawberry, uh, which is an invasive species. Um, you didn't, well, it's not really, it's sort of an early summer flowering plant. You didn't really talk about our wild strawberry uh, for Jerry of Virginia, uh, Virginiana, I think it is. Never remember if that one's Virginiana or Virginica, but regardless, um, any thoughts on um, wild strawberry versus Indian mock strawberry? I hate to put you on the on the spot there. Well, I did consider putting in more ground covers like that, and decided to focus on things that were more flowering instead of this was not a ground cover talk. Mm -hmm. And you, of course, have given the ground cover talk for <laughs> the Plant Society. Um, so thank you for identifying that little pesky strawberry that is in our yards that you called mock strawberry that I think you can pull out. And then there's other strawberries, the strawberry that you mentioned, this, the, can you say the scientific name again? Uh, uh, for Jerry of Virginiana. <laughs> yes, which is a nice ground cover. And I use it as a ground cover and it has the runners. It's, as I understand it, it's one of the parents of the cultivated strawberry and it has the runners and it really quickly can fill in, um, which is nice. But so that you don't wanna pull out if you have it, but I doubt that that's what someone has in their yard. I planted that. I yeah, they, grow, they probably don't. I mean, we were very fortunate when we moved here. We actually had it growing wild on our property, uh, which was nice. Um, but it's, it's one of the things that's very easy to tell apart is the wild strawberry has a white flower. The Indian mock strawberry has a yellow flower. Mm -hmm. um, dead giveaway, dead mm -hmm. giveaway. Mm -hmm. Deb, we're, we're just about out of time here. Is there anything that you would like to, uh, any parting comments, thoughts that you would like to leave us with this evening? There's lots and lots of comments, lots of, um, lots of questions about how to manage invasives, lots of questions about ground covers and lots of compliments on your wonderful presentation this evening. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? 
Sure. I would say to people who have questions on invasives to go to Google New Jersey Strike Team Task Force because then that is a website that has great information about invasives. So go to that. Then I would like to say thank you to Mike for doing the tech. And that's very valuable. It's a kind of behind the scenes job that sometimes is not acknowledged, but it's so important. And I appreciate that you were there and with the backup of the PowerPoint in case we had problems. And then Randy, thanks to you for um, being the host and being the, the, it was comforting to be asked questions by you knowing that you knew all the answers. Oh, I never know all the answers. I'm always thanks learning. Everyone who is still watching um, for staying so long, for spending this time together tonight. And just to repeat my request to celebrate Earth Day by planting a spring native plant and sharing the information with a friend or family member, best of all, a young person. Very good. Thank you very much, Deb. Thanks everyone for being here. Please visit mpsnj.org uh, for more information about uh, other upcoming webinars and other information on, a, on a, our website, which is just chock full of information. And Deb's presentation will be posted as a video uh, in a couple of days. Give us a little bit of time to get that posted. Thanks Thank very you. much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And enjoy and the, and the wildflowers. Indeed. Take care. Good, good night, everyone. Good night, all.